Um, so I'm a software engineer at Pinterest. Uh, my name is Brandon. Um, I'm not going to be talking about Haskell. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Swift, right? Interesting. OK. So uh, we're going to be talking about caching at the application level, all right? So uh, just a reminder, why do we want caching? Getting things over the network is slow. Getting things from disk is faster. Getting things from memory is faster. Um, but we have limited memory. We have limited disk. So, so when, we, when we want some resource, uh, we, we have to go through this process, right? So, so a key comes in. We check RAM. If it's there, we return the value. If it's not there, then we look on disk. If it's on disk, we write back to RAM, return the value. If it's not on disk, we'll hit the network. If that fails, we'll just say that the whole thing failed. Uh, if that succeeds, we'll write to disk, we'll write to RAM, and we'll return the value. OK? Um, more concretely, uh, we could have an image cache. So URLs come in. We check for a bitmap in RAM. We check for a JPEG on disk. Um, but you know, in your application, let's say you're making a, some mobile app, right? Uh, you may have videos also. Um, and if you, if you look uh, for videos, usually um, your framework will handle the memory layer for you. So, so we, we only check disk before hitting the network. Um, and, and then if, if you think about it, we also have all this other metadata that we're caching. So for example, user profiles, right? So, so like a user ID can come in. We can check for structured profile data and memory. Um, and then on disk, we'll be checking for JSON, OK? So, so all of these uh, caches are, are similar, but they're a little bit different. And we would like to not write the same code over and over again. Um, and and you know, one way we can do this is we can uh, design a system where we can compose things together, right? So, uh, so I've, I've drawn this diagram in a particular way, uh, you know, associating disk and network in particular, so that we can use that bit for for video, right? And and it actually uh, not only does it make sense to just have some structure that we can instantiate um, multiple times, but uh, actually reusing that same thing. So. So why, why does that make sense, to have one variable that we reuse across our program for, for certain caches? Um, it's because you're, you're dealing with these resources that are inherently um, shared across your system. So, so disk is one example. Um, if you have uh, two, two um, objects poking your disk at once, um, you have, you know, let's say you only want to use a gigabyte. Uh, when you're up towards the edge, you know, your, your checks might get confusing. Maybe you'll have to do communication between the two things if you, wanna, um, if you want things to be perfect, correct. Uh, same with, with networking. We have limited bandwidth. And uh, let's say we want to prioritize requests. If we have one system to handle that, then our life becomes much easier. So with that in mind, let's code. Uh, we're writing Swift. Um, I'm sure a lot of you don't know Swift. So, uh, here, we're, we're making cache a protocol. Um, this, is, this is like a blueprint uh, for what a class or a struct can adopt. Um, it's kind of like an interface or a trait in other languages. One thing that we can do is we can have associated types. So we can say uh, the, uh, you know, a concrete instance that implements cache must provide a key and a value. Um, another thing we want is a get method. So given a key, we will give back a future of a value. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, think of a future as a value that represents um, some piece of information that's asynchronously fulfilled or not. Um, and, and we can chain transformations on success or on error uh, to get back a new future. So we have get. Um, set, uh, we, we want this operation on our caches as well. So given a key and a value, uh, we'll return something that will tell us when uh, the set has finished. So uh, we have our protocol. If we go and try and implement uh, an in-memory cache, we, we can make it generic on k and v uh, with the constraint that, that our k must be hashable. Um, and, and the reason we'll do that is to have a hash map that backs our, our cache. Uh, and then we can bind our associated types, our key to k, our value to v. Um, in Swift, you do this with a type alias. And, and our get will, will read the hash map. Um, and our set will set the hash map. Uh, for, for disk. We can, we can say we're generic on some k, uh, and k has to be stringable in some way. And then we can MD5 that string and use that as a file name. And, and inside the file, we can store bytes. So, 
So we're binding our key to k, um, which is like something that can be stringed, and then our value to ns data, which on iOS means just a bunch of bytes. Uh, and, and get will read the file, set will, will write to the file. And you know, now we have two caches, but, but we don't want two caches. We want one thing that we can, we can request some key and we get back a value. Uh, so, so we want to stick them together. And, and think about this, turn it sideways. You get something that sort of looks like this. Uh, so, so a request is coming in. First, we want to check RAM. If it's there, we, we return the value. That's the, the violet arrow in my diagram. Um, if it's not there, follow the gold arrow, and then we check disk. If it's on disk, then we write it back to RAM and return. If it's not on disk, then we fail. Okay? Um, so nothing about this depended on RAM or disk, so let's just erase it. Uh, and we can say, as long as the types are the same, as long as the keys are the same between the two caches, because if a request misses, we have to try with the same key. As long as the values are the same, because if we miss the first time and we, we succeed, we get a hit on the second cache, then we have to write it to the first cache, then uh, this logic makes sense. Um, but what we can do now is we can just say, this is a cache. This, this piece of logic will wrap it up in a little package. Uh, and, and that's good. Um, so so let's, let's implement that. Uh, so in Swift, we can, we can say, um, I want this method, this, this compose operation, to uh, exist on all instances of caches. And, and we can do that with the extension uh, keyword. So our method, compose, uh, it takes a cache, another cache, B. And, and it's not a concrete type. It, it's generic because you know, if we want to compose RAM and disk, those are actually two different types. They just both happen to conform to the cache protocol. Um, but we, we can only do this when the constraint that the keys are the same and the val values are the same. So that's the where clause here. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to return a basic cache. Um, and think of a basic cache as uh, a record of closures, which uh, it's, not, you know, it's not the greatest thing, but it'll work. So, so we want get, OK? Um, get's the first thing. Uh, so in our, in our big cache, our, our composition, we're first going to check the first cache. Um, now we'll get back a future. Uh, this or else operator on futures, it says, if that future succeeds, just return it. If it fails, execute the stuff on the right. And the stuff on the right, it'll, it'll check the next cache. If that succeeds, that's the map, then we write it to the first cache and return the value. So uh, set, set uh, we can just set to both in parallel. There, there's no dependency between the two caches for setting. So we'll, we'll write to both asynchronously and, and wait for both to be done. That's the future.join. Uh, so we do this. Now we can. Now we can make a cache uh, that's, that's made up of two caches. And, and that's cool. And we can even add a third cache, uh, and that'll work. And if, if we think about our, our example, we have RAM and disk. Um, what we can do for our third cache, uh, and this actually is useful, is to model the network as a cache. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to say, OK, URLs are keys, and our value is bytes, and, and our get is just going to make a network request. Um, and, and for set, we'll just do nothing. So if we do that, then uh, we have a decision about how we're going to compose these three things together. So we can, we can first compose RAM and disk, and then network. Or we can do disk and network first, and then put RAM at the front. Um, now, these are the same. The proof is left as an exercise. Uh, so you can, you can try and figure that out if you want. But, um, they are the same. So, so this means that this compose operation is associative, which is pretty cool. Um, another, another property that we want is to have some identity that's, that's well behaved. So think about a cache that always misses. OK, so there, there's no violet arrow. There's just the gold. Um, if we stick that on the left, that's the, this top example, then we'll always miss. So we'll always go to the real cache. And then the real cache will just behave as it always did. So it's as if we had not composed anything at all. Um, if we take the identity and compose it on the right, um, when, it, when a request comes in, it'll first hit the first cache. If it succeeds, then it's as if we had not composed anything at all. It behaves the same. If we fail, we're going to fail again. So, uh, so our, our identity is well behaved. And, and this means um, the fact that we have an associative binary operator and we have an identity element, uh, that means we have a monoid. And this is what a monoid is. So if you didn't know, now you do. Um, 
and it's, it's useful. Monoids are, are good. So we can fold. Uh, we can say, start with the identity, combine RAM and disk and network, and smash it all together into one cache that, that behaves in the way that we want. We can, we can associate disk and network first. We can store that in a variable. We can reuse that across our program. And, uh, and then we, we get this um, simplicity that, that comes out of managing our, our disk and our network. And, and this, this mostly gets us all the way there. But, but if, you, if you recall, for disk, I said keys were strings. For network, I said keys were URLs. And, and our memory layer needs to be structured data, fully decoded. Um, and that's so that we don't have to uh, do an expensive conversion every time we retrieve information. So, so our RAM is going to be a bitmap, let's say. And our, our disk is going to give us back bytes. So we're trying to take circles and uh, layer them with triangles. And that's, that's not going to work. So, so we can, we can do some sort of magic transformations and, and, uh, and turn one cache that is not the same shape as the other into something that uh, will fit together. So if we have a way to turn circles into triangles, and we have a way to turn triangles into circles, and we have a circle cache, we would like a triangle cache. Um, concretely, we have a cache that gives us bytes. We have a way to turn bytes into a bitmap, a way to turn a bitmap into bytes. And we'd like to be able to apply these, uh, these transformations with some sort of map values operator and get back a new cache that gives us bitmaps. Um, and and these, these transform caches, we're not actually like digging into the imperative core of the implementation details of our caches. We're, they're, they're these like virtual projections on our real caches. What, what we're doing is when, when a request goes in, um, if we had transformed the keys, we, we run our transformation our inverse transform on our way in to our real cache. We, we get the value out, and then we might run another transformation on the way out. And, and if we wrap that up in a package, we can make it look like a triangle cache. Uh, so in code, if we have a way to turn circles into triangles, a way to turn triangles into circles. We have a circle cache. We want a triangle cache. We can call get on our circle cache. We get back a future of a circle. We, we apply the circle to triangle transformation with map. And now uh, that should type check. For, for set, this is our new cache. So, so we're given a, a triangle. And we have to set it into a cache that takes circles. So, so we, we do the inverse transform. Um, now, nothing about this is uh, specific to circles and triangles. So we can say, OK, this will work with bytes and bitmaps. Um, and nothing about this is specific to bytes and bitmaps. So it'll work with any two values. Um, so this is good. This is good. We can, we can transform our caches. Uh, keys, key transformations are, are similar. We can. Uh, if we have the inverse transformation, then we can create uh, a cache of this new key type. So uh, we're, we're given the new key, and we have to call get with the old key, so new to old. Uh, and same with set. We're given the new key. We have to call set on the old cache, new to old, this inverse transform. Uh, in a picture, triangle to circle, we have a cache that accepts circles as keys. We want a cache that accepts triangles as keys. Concretely, we have our disk cache. Um, we, we have a way to turn URLs into strings. We can apply it with map keys, and we get back a cache that accepts URLs. So finally, we can, we can hook everything up together. Um, this will work. Uh, we, can, we can write the code. Um, we, can, we can start with our, our imperative disk cache that we write once our imperative network cache that basically is the thing that will interact with the network um, that we write once. These are complex. They have to handle errors. But we, we do it once. We'll, we'll write tests. And it, whenever we fix a bug, we fix it everywhere. right? So that's good. Uh, we can combine them. We can, we can take that, that composition and, and transform it into something that uh, will give us back bitmaps. And, and then because that operation is, is expensive, we'll, we'll put that behind a memory cache. Um, and and this, is, this is the code. This is basically what it looks like uh, in, in source, which is cool. But um, if, you, if you run this, you'll, you'll run into an issue pretty fast. So, so here's, here's the problem. Um, there's messaging between two users going on. Uh, and we're, we're going to show their, their profile pictures, their avatars next to the messages. And, and they've, they've been corresponding for a while, so there's 20 messages. So, so, 10 requests will go in for the same URL. They'll all check RAM, and they'll all miss. Then all 10 will hit disk, and all 10 will miss. 
then all 10 will hit the network, and then we're going to make 10 network requests for the same URL. And uh, that's not good. So what we want is a way to reuse in-flight requests. And, and we can do that. We can, we can uh, take a dictionary that uh, stores our, uh, it, it maps our keys to the requests that are in flight, and that's just the future. So, so then get is simply check the dictionary before actually performing the operation that, that is expensive, and, and set is the same. And, and there's, there's a little bit more you have to do to, to free from the dictionary, but, but this is basically it. And, and this is cool. This is, this is completely decoupled from the specifics of our network cache, let's say, but, but we can attach it to our network cache, and, and we get back a smart network cache that um, if you make two requests really fast, uh, it's the, the same request. The, the references are the same, so we're only hitting the network once. Um, and, and most image caching libraries will support this, but the code will be so tangled in with the, the networking code that um, it's not reusable. Uh, but something that, that we can do, because, because it is separate, is we can take this transformation and apply it to the composition of disk and network. So now, not only are we, are we reusing in-flight requests over the network, but we're reusing uh, I.O. stuff on, on disk. So, uh, so, so if we're anywhere in, in the process of checking disk or checking the network, um, we can reuse in-flight requests. And, and this same approach applies for any sort of transformation that you may want to do that's, that's cache agnostic, like um, capping concurrency, for example. So we stick this on the end of our first line, and then we're good. Things are fixed. We, we have, uh, we've, we've tamed our complexity. Um, we've, we've sort of, we've minimized the surface area, right? There, there's, if you're writing an iOS app, for example, um, you have to interact with imperative APIs at some point, but at least we can wrap it up and only think about it once. Um, and, and we can build a system where we can use these Legos and, and mix them and match them in different ways uh, to, to build up these different caches. Um, and our code kind of reads like, uh, like poetry. <laughs> so it's, it's good. Um, let's say you want to do this. You, you want to use this, and you're writing Swift. There's a library called Carlos, um, written by Vittorio and Isad. It does a lot about what we've talked about here, um, and it will eventually do all the things that we've talked about here. There's also, if you're more interested in the types, so I, I have a PureScript implementation um, that I made to help get my head around everything. Uh, and I believe that a cache is a pro functor with respect to the values and a contravariant functor with respect to the keys, as well as being a monoid. So, uh, if you understand what I'm saying, you should check that out because it's quite interesting. Um, there's a link here, and there's a link to the slides here, so you can just go there now or whenever. Um, but that's it. So thanks for listening. I'm Brandon. Yeah. Yeah, so I had two questions, but your last slide stole my second question. So, because I was about to say, isn't it the profunctor? And uh, yeah, so that's, I think. It is. Cool. Does that give you additional power to do anything? Yes. Um, so, not in Swift, or, well, maybe if you, if you have a really good understanding of the type classes. But um, certainly, uh, you, get, you get to use the, um, the, you know, all the, all the operations that exist on profunctors and, and contravariant functors. And, uh, and I don't, um, don't quote me on this, but uh, I believe um, Phil Freeman told me that uh, they can kind of, caches are kind of lenses because mm -hmm. they're profunctors. Um, so that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's also a subject I'm interested in. And my first question was more about the, the failure modes. So you're sending uh, and concurrently two different set requests, and if any of them fail, you just fail the full thing. Do you think there could be some modes where it's not too bad if one of them fails and you can still proceed and you should still proceed? Yes. Um, yeah, that makes sense. You know, so in, in practice, um, I think I never used set explicitly. Um, it was only used as part of the internals during the composition. Um, I think if you, if you end up writing some software that ends up using set a lot, you'll run into that. Uh, okay. you, you, like, you might want to handle something there. 
um, differently. And I think, uh, I think that could be worth exploring. Okay, thanks. So my question was also about set. You, have, you do a set on a composition by uh, doing two concurrent sets to the components. So doesn't that mean that if two concurrent processes set at the same time, you might end up with different values in the two subcaches? Is that a problem? Do you need to do something about that? Two concurrent. Uh, yeah, you have two processes. Each mm -hmm. does set. Each set turns into two concurrent sets on the two subcaches. Mm -hmm. and they might happen in different orders at each cache. That, uh, I see. So, so it like splits like a tree. Is that what you're saying? And but does, so would the ordering ever matter, though? Um, well, sure. If you're doing two sets of the same key with mm -hmm. different values, like you know A and B, then you could end end up setting it first to A and then B in right. the RAM, and first to B and then A on the disk. I see. And then you'd have a, a and, and unusual some, situation, to say the least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, okay. So um, that would be bad, I guess. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I mean, so the the, the worst case. The worst thing that could happen is that um, I mean, so if you if your if your caches are made up of the same core pieces in two different places, um, then then you could get a, have a serious problem. I, I think that that doesn't actually uh, happen in practice, where where you're using the same instance, the same disk cache in two different places in the same layering. So so that won't matter. Uh, so we we won't run into a weird. Uh, I set this after this, but this my prior write took over. Um, and, and if they are different instances, then maybe we, we could end up in a situation where, uh, where the, the value exists in RAM, but not disk, maybe. But then uh, we'll just end up short circuiting and life will be OK. Um, so yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, thank you. So uh, how do you handle, for example, invalidation? You'll have mm, uh, yes. also a uh, state inside the cache, or yes. you'll try to parameterize, but then you have to change all the uh, interfaces, right? Or so, um, so yeah, so I'm hiding some details. In the, in the, in the Carlos library, there is um, there's a bit of uh, an abstraction leak, I'd say, or it's, it's just it's unfortunate. But the cache protocol includes an on-memory warning. Uh, and, and this is, um, is composed as well. So, so you can choose to handle this memory warning that the operating system gives you, let's say, uh, to, to free, to invalidate some keys, like to, to free some, some memory. Um, and, and yeah, the, the caches themselves uh, are imperative uh, black boxes, I'd say, that uh, you know, will do a bunch of side effects and handle that, that state for you. Uh, so that's how, that's how we did it um, in practice. OK, thank you. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, backend systems like Finagle from, from Twitter that do RPCs and all of the data center service routing stuff that you need. Have you, have you thought about or, or built integration from the caching layers and the endpoints uh, to, to these other systems? Because they have very similar theory. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I haven't built anything, but I have thought about it. It's, uh, I, I don't think a system, or I don't think a monoidal caching system um, exists anywhere else. Um, and it totally makes sense for the back end as well. Uh, like if you have your, I don't know, memcache and then your database, uh, and then maybe uh, something even slower, I don't know, uh, like in a, a Google Maps API or whatever. Uh, yeah, like that, you, you should be able to build up your, your caches from these pieces. I, I haven't built anything, but I think it's definitely a good idea to explore. Let's thank Brendan.